First, I want to touch on the foundational issues. Because if you don't understand the foundational issues, you won't see why this makes any difference. Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. Moses lays down the foundations for the gospel message in the first and third chapters of the book of Genesis. And this is where we're told that God created a perfect universe. It was perfect until Adam's sin corrupted it. And that's why we live in a world of death and suffering today. God didn't make the world this way. Sin corrupted it. That original sin separated man from God, requiring that we be redeemed with God. And the first promise of a Redeemer is given in Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman, meaning this coming Redeemer will be born of a virgin, will bruise the head of the serpent. And that is the foundation for the gospel message. And this is why you see biblical creation under relentless assault in our secular society. They don't have to get you to not know what the Bible says if they can just convince you that the Bible is not true. And therefore, there's no need for Jesus' sacrifice to redeem you with a creator. The global flood is the linchpin in this whole worldview issue. The Bible says that God judged man's sin with a global flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. And today, we find the crust of the whole earth made up of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water, full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly that they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Now, I said the other week, on the way home from church the other day, I saw a dead raccoon on the side of the road. Three days later, when I drove back this way, coming to church, the raccoon was gone. Oh, well, I thought that it, for sure it was going to just lay there for millions of years and get covered by sediments. No, it got eaten by a scavenger, you know. Things need to be buried quickly to become preserved so they can become fossils. It doesn't just happen under normal circumstances. Now, 2 Peter 3, the Apostle Peter said that there shall come scoffers in the last days and that they will be willingly ignorant that means dumb on purpose, willingly ignorant of the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us about the worldwide flood of Noah's day. And they deny that it ever happened because they know that such an event would have ripped up and destroyed any evidence of evolution over millions of years and that we are subject to God's judgment. So that's why they want to make sure that the worldwide flood is not a real thing. And that means, hey, there was no perfect creation corrupted by some original sin that allowed death to enter and separated you from some supposed creator. No, man evolved on his own. And any belief, though, that puts death before Adam undermines the gospel message, no matter how well intended you think it might be. Again, I used to be a theistic evolutionist, a Christian who tries to blend evolution into God's Word. But once more, that puts death before Adam, which doesn't work. And I'm not attacking anyone who believes such things. I'm just trying to help, just like somebody, praise God, took the time to help me. But remember, the Bible says in the beginning God created. 
Jesus says in Mark and Matthew that man was made since the beginning. The biblical message is that man's sin corrupted the perfect creation, allowing death to enter, separating you from God, and Jesus' death on the cross redeemed you with God. Any belief that puts death before Adam, therefore, undermines all that. You can't have death before Adam and Adam's sin bringing death into the world both. They totally contradict each other. So what we're here to do today is to show you, hey, you can drop all those other beliefs. You can believe what God's Word says. If it makes sense, there's no sense in doing anything else, right? And atheists really understand this well, and they have for a long time. This is from the American Atheist magazine. It says, destroy original sin, and in the rubble you'll find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means by putting death before Adam, then Christianity is nothing. They know that very well. And I pretty much have to agree with them. If that's true, Christianity is nothing. No wonder Jesus said, If you don't believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? The book of Genesis is foundational. Jesus says so clearly. And today, 85% of Christian children leave the church by the time that they are 20. That's 17 out of every 20 leave the church by the time they're 20. Because they're going through 16 years of schooling telling them that they evolved without God. No wonder the Bible warns, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the rudiments of the world which means after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So beware of man's philosophies. The study of our origins, where we came from, is not about the evidence. We all have the same evidence. It's about the worldview through which the evidences are interpreted. And there really are only two viable philosophies out there. Either God created the world and everything in it just like he says he did, or the world evolved all on its own, as the secular system teaches. Of course, there is that group that says, well, hey, maybe we're not here at all. We just think we're here. But as a general rule, I don't pay much attention to these guys because we really are here. And the Bible says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So let's do what the Word of God tells us to do. Now operational science is knowledge derived from the study and testing of obs observable, repeatable, testable evidences. Things have to be there so you can test, study, and observe them in order to be true science. Operational science has led to many great improvements in our lives from cars to airplanes to space shuttles to penicillin and hospitals, computers to video games. Well, mostly improvements. <laughs> but all that, all that is real science, okay? Things you can study and observe. There's also historical science. And a lot of biology and geology today are historical sciences, where you take things you can observe today 
and try to extrapolate the results onto things you cannot observe from the past. But observational science, things you can test, study, and observe, that's a believer's best friend. You see, for the last 50 years, kids have been taught that Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, and it started out as a hot ball of rock. And then the oceans formed, and it rained on the rock for millions of years. I like to kid the evolutionists because I used to be one of them, and, and now they say to me, oh, so you believe that your invisible fairy tale God created the whole world. I say, you believe we evolved from a wet rock, <laughs> right? I mean, the Big Bang, a big rock formed. It rained on the rock until what happened? Well, you're sitting there with this big, wet, sterile rock. So where did we come from? Yeah, well, we believe, they believe that we came from this wet rock. And if you point this out to them, then sometimes it makes them start thinking, well, maybe I do have a religious belief here. But you see, they've been taught that this is science. Who saw the Big Bang? Who observed the big rock form? Nobody. Who saw it rain on the rock? Nobody. These are all beliefs. It's not science. None of it is science. It's a belief on how we came about. It's a belief system concerning our origins. Again, prove all things. The prophet Jeremiah predicted this would happen. It says that they be saying to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth, for they have turned their back on me. He predicted it. Children today are taught that they've evolved from a rock. Really? I certainly was taught that. Weren't you? Most people were. What about the scientific law of biogenesis? Real science. A believer's best friend. The law of biogenesis is a principle of real biology. And what it says is, life only comes from life. In other words, non-life, like a sterile wet rock, cannot produce life. Life only comes from life. So how do Darwinists get life started? Well, first of all, they're going to say that Darwinism has nothing to do with the start of life. Why not? Well, because there's no way to start life without life. So they try not to deal with that. But here, this textbook tries to get around the issue by saying, kids, kids, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. Stated as fact, but found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Well, how's a kid supposed to argue with that? You know, he's just been told that this is a scientific fact, right? But what evidence do they have? Well, it says right here, no traces of those events remain. Well, I thought science was knowledge derived from the observation of evidence. From the Big Bang to the start of life, they've got no evidence. It's a religious belief. And since they say that we started out as a little simple single cell something or other, let's take a look at a bacterial cell very simple single cell organism. Biochemists have found that these cells are run by tiny molecular motors 
called bacterial flagellum. Now these tiny molecular motors allow the cell to swim around and perform functions. They can even change gears depending on how much weight they're towing or pushing. Now they're made up of about 40 different very complex proteins which must be there complete and whole and in the exact order to form the bacterial flagellum at the exact moment life started or life could not have started on its own. They're known as irreducibly complex. That means if any one of those proteins was missing a piece or if they weren't in the right order, life could never have started because they wouldn't have been able to function. Yeah, you can't simplify it. Right, irreducibly complex. Mm -hmm. And to make matters worse for Darwinism, the process of putting the flagellum together requires other molecular motors that are themselves irreducibly complex. In other words, as real science, a believer's best friend, gets into the genome of the cell, the more and more complex they become. They are way beyond human comprehension at this point in time. And they probably always will be. So Darwinists are going to try to get kids to think that they have created life from non-life in the lab. That scientists in labs have been able to do it. But if you look closely at their experiments, they've come nowhere near creating life in a lab. Now, they've been able to create, and think about this, they've been able to create non-living chemical compounds that are found in life. It'd be like you or I creating calcium. And since calcium is found in the human body, announcing to the world, we've created a human being, when all we did was create calcium. See, they've come nowhere near creating life in the lab. And the law of biogenesis has never been known to have been violated. Well, evolutions are becoming more concerned about the growing popularity of the creation worldview. So much so that some universities are even offering courses in evolution versus creation. And one of the primary textbooks they use to try to debunk creationists is called Evolution versus Creationism. It's written by Eugenie Scott, who is one of the world's most outspoken atheists. She's also the president of the National Center for Science Education. So let's go to the book written by the president of the National Center for Science Education to see how they explain life starting from non-life. On page 26, here's her explanation. The origin of life was not a sudden event, but a continuum of events, with a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. <laughs> iffy stuff. So this is the modern college textbook explaining how life started without God. The iffy stuff. And they are making fun of us. Bill Gates said DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than any software mankind has ever created. The DNA system is way beyond our comprehension. One mathematician and molecular biologist calculated the odds on just one DNA chromosome forming on its own in nature as being 1 in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Well, what kind of number is that? <laughs> I mean, 1 in 10 to the 50th power is considered 
absolute zero. One in 10 to the 100 billionth power, I mean, it would be like the odds of winning the Powerball lottery every week, 52 weeks a year, for 27,000 years in a row. And that would be mathematically better than one DNA chromosome forming on its own. In other words, it's a mathematical impossibility, which is why the law of biogenesis has never been overcome. So think about it logically. Millions of scientists building on years and years of millions of other scientists' research with billions of dollars in salaries and funding, with computers and lab equipment thrown in, cannot make non-living matter produce living matter in a lab, in controlled environments. Yet, we're supposed to believe that rocks and seawater did it on their own? Oh, but not today when you could test it and see it happening. No, long ago and far away, it somehow happened. That's not science. That's a religious belief, which is undermining and damaging scientific research and scientific education. Former Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner George Wald said, Modern biologists, having reviewed the downfall of spontaneous generation, who are yet unwilling to accept special creation, are left with nothing. Nothing. Except the iffy stuff. That's always there. So, they've got no way to get life started. So let's let them off the hook and uh, move ahead to Darwinism. Look at this from Nature Magazine, the most prestigious scientific journal. The origins of animals is as much a mystery as the origin of life. Wait a minute. I thought they had all this supposed evidence. Now it sounds like they've just got more iffy stuff, doesn't it? Let's look at some of this. If you understand the difference between micro and macro evolution, you could win a debate anywhere with a Darwinist. And that's why they won't debate anymore. And in case you don't believe me, I'd be glad to debate any teacher, professor, or other Darwinist, any one, any five, any ten of them, because what's ten times zero evidence? I mean, how are they going to win? Now, the word evolution does have many different meanings, so we'll just discuss two, micro and macro evolution. See, trying to define evolution can be like trying to nail jello to a wall sometimes. <laughs> but, but let's give this as a definition so we can understand some issues here. Microevolution is just changes within the same kind of plant or animal. So let's just get the word evolution out of there. We'll call these micro adaptations. Okay, they're just changes within the same kind. You could go down to the pound and get a pair of dogs, male and female, and mutts work the best because they have the widest gene pool. And you could breed dogs together for a hundred years, favoring the traits that you like, and you could end up with bulldogs, poodles, and all sorts of things after a hundred years. How many non-dogs would you end up with? Right. Well, it's, it's almost laughable. It's ridiculous thought, right? But that would be Darwinism, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, that would be a macro change. A dog producing a non-dog, like a cat or a kumquat or something like that. That would be macro 
evolution. In other words, it would be a kind producing another kind. You can breed roses and get red, pink, yellow roses. Some do better in cold, wet climates. Others do better in dry, hot climates. But roses are only going to produce roses. Dogs will only produce dogs. People will only produce people. Kinds will only bring forth after their own kind. I could show you a million examples if I wanted to. There are about 14 right here. I mean, guess how many examples of Darwinian evolution there are that stand up to real science? Zero. Yeah, right. There's never been even one viable example found. Why is it important for Christians to understand that kinds will bring forth after their own kinds? Because ten times in the book of Genesis, we're told that plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. And after millions of scientific observations, guess what is found every single time? Kinds only bring forth after their kind. Just like the Word of God told us ten times in Genesis 1. Do you think that maybe God knew this would be a major point of attack in the last days? I do. Now let me give you a couple of things to think about here. If you will remember this one fact, it'll be another reason Darwinists can never fool you again. Gene depletion, also called genetic entropy, causes these micro changes within the same times. Gene depletion is what causes these micro changes within the same times. That is, it's sorting or loss of genetic information. In other words, offspring start out with genetic information inherited from their parents. Adaptations are caused by recombination or loss, gene depletion. So the gene pools get weaker and weaker. Now students are given a lot of examples of biblically correct microadaptations. But then they switch the discussion to Darwin, Darwinian macroevolution, and kids are fooled into thinking they've been shown proof of Darwinism. They are told or led to believe that the Bible is not true, when really they've been shown that the Bible is true. Darwinists are pulling the old bait-and-switch con game here. They do it all the time. You see, Darwinists focus the discussion on micro, which is biblically correct, because there's no evidence of Darwinian macro to show anybody. So they focus on the micro. There never has been any macroevolution evidence to show anyone. See, when Darwin landed on the Galapagos, he made a great observation. He counted 14 varieties of finches. Black, yellow, thin-billed, thick-billed. He observed micro-adaptations, kinds bringing forth after their kind. Finches, right? Just like the Bible says. But he jumped to the miraculously erroneous conclusion that somehow, given enough time, the magic ingredient, that these <coughs> changes would lead to improvements and birds would become non-birds. Dogs would become non-dogs. Apes might even become non-apes, like humans. So they don't actually teach Darwinism anymore. 
They haven't for years and years because they have no mechanism to add the new and beneficial genetic information that would cause an ape to turn into a person. So now they teach neo-Darwinism. But this is based on three false assumptions. First, that, that mutations create new and beneficial genetic information. They say that's where the information comes from. But we don't really see that happen. There are some false claims being made along those lines where mutations have supposedly added new and beneficial information, but nobody can really demonstrate that. Number two, natural selection causes the mutant to take over the population leading to Darwinian change. Given the magic ingredient Long ages, millions of years of time. See, this is why a global flood wipes out every old age belief. You've got to keep that in mind. The flood is the linchpin. Because um, that erases their magic ingredient of time. Here's a problem for Neo-Darwinism. After millions of scientific observations, what we find is that mutations are also caused by the sorting or loss of the parent's gene pool. Gene depletion applies to mutations just like it applies to adaptations. Now, natural selection is a fact. If a creature gets into an environment where it can't survive, it dies. It's that simple. There isn't a selector there that selects it, it just dies. Because it wasn't created with the information to survive in that condition. And that's a process that we have labeled natural selection. I prefer to use the term God's Quality Assurance Program. Think about it. Things are losing genetic information. They're getting weaker and weaker. If they weren't removed from the gene pool, they would corrupt the gene pool. And everything would go extinct in about a thousand years. Well, what keeps the weaker mutants from corrupting the gene pools? They get too weak. They get removed by natural selection. They get into an environment they can't survive in, and they die. It's God's quality assurance program to make sure that the kinds will survive. Yet here's a book telling kids how natural selection causes evolution. Natural selection doesn't have anything to do with Darwinism. If it did, it would prevent it. It's God's quality assurance program that keeps his gene pools genetically sound. So, up to the PhD level of science, students are taught that mutations plus natural selection lead to neo-Darwinian evolution. But here, is how you scientifically destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. You ready? Here's how you scientifically destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Stop your watch. Oops, I'm sorry, that was only three seconds. It's a scientific impossibility. And this is the reason they can't get over the law of biogenesis. This is the reason they don't have any viable examples to show. It never happened. 
Yet this Nobel Prize winning scientist said, anything that we scientists can do to weaken the hold on religion should be done. And evidently that includes filling textbooks full of lies, frauds, and misrepresentations of the evidence. And in case you didn't notice this, realize something. He's pushing his religious beliefs, whether they admit it or not. If you're an atheist, that's your religious belief. Atheism is one of the strongest beliefs. You really have to have faith to think that everything came about on its own. So let's look at some of the famous frauds in the textbooks. I imagine every one of you have seen this while you were in school. This is Ernst Haeckel. He read Charles Darwin's book ten years after it was published in 1869. And he had the same problem Darwinists have today. He couldn't find any evidence that it had happened. Well, he did what Darwinists have become famous for. He invented some evidence, and he came up with a biogenetic law, also called the theory of recapitulation. Kids, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Speak English. Yeah, how is a kid supposed to argue with that? You know, what that means is you go through your evolutionary stages while you're in your mother's womb. Okay. Now what I'm going to show you is his drawings, and they go from left to right across the top. These are his drawings, and right below are the actual photos. He's got these things labeled fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, human. It was proven in the 1870s that he falsified these. What he did was take a human in the embryonic state, he made a drawing of it, and then he made copies of it and labeled them as other animals, claiming that you go through your evolutionary stages in your mother's womb. Then he wrote the theory of recapitulation, proven fraud by his own university in the 1870s, and yet still taught as scientific fact in colleges today. Here's a current college textbook. It tells students that whether they develop into fish, amphibians, or humans, all vertebrate embryos start out very similar with gill slits and a long tail. See, I'm not there in those classrooms kids are being taught that this is a fact. And I'm surprised that only 85% of Christian kids are leaving the church. What's wrong with the other 15%? Aren't they paying attention to what they're being taught? Look at this. My friends, you never had gills or gill slits. You had folds of the skin that later developed into organs in the throat and neck area. They're not things that are gill slits. This is what happens. And you never had a long tail. One of the first things that develops in a human embryo is the backbone. And we named the end of the backbone the tailbone, not because there was ever a tail there, it's just what we called it. And the book goes on. I mean, think logically, students. Why would humans have embryos with gill slits and a tail unless their ancestors also once had these features? And kids' faith is destroyed. I don't know about you, but I get mad about it. You know, we need to get this information out to people. Have you ever heard that you are 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee, proving you're a close relative to the chimp. Actually, real science 
a believer's best friend, has this down now to or below 90%. In fact, this one has chimps, X and Y chromosomes with as much as a 30% difference. A 30% difference. Do you want to talk about complexity? You are made up of about 80 trillion cells. And each cell's DNA contains 3 billion base pairs of genetic information. Talk about complexity. A 30% difference would require 925 million information adding beneficial mutations to take place just to change a chimp into a human. And Darwinists can't show you one single viable example between bacteria cells and everything else in the world that will stand up to scrutiny. If genetic similarity proves our evolutionary past, then they should teach kids that we evolved from worms. You're 70% the same in your biochemistry as some worms. Um, you're 50% the same as a banana. Did anyone here evolve from a banana? Hmm? I don't know if people have seen it. <laughs> yeah, I went and checked my family tree and I couldn't find a banana in the whole bunch. He's appealing. <laughs> it's appealing, yeah. <laughs> right. Have you ever heard this one, that bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics or insects becoming resistant to insecticides is proof they're evolving to be bigger and better? That's one of the things they always teach. Well, this has nothing to do with the evolution of new kinds with new and beneficial genetic information. Let's say I had a thousand cockroaches right here on the floor and I let them run out into their cafe but I sprayed insecticide on them killing 998 but two survived. Did those two instantaneously evolve an immune system? No, they already had a gene in their gene pool that allowed them to survive. The other 998 either didn't have it or it was switched off and they died. The two evolved nothing. The information was already there. Now when they have offspring, the offspring inherit that gene and the entire population is immune to the poison but they evolved nothing. So why do Darwinists use this as one of their big proofs? Because they've got nothing. They don't have any real evidence. You see, gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Yet this textbook says, Hey kids, we've got proof of evolution through the fossil record. Well, if Darwinism were true and the strata layers formed slowly over never seen umpteen millions of years, then they should be full of evidence if it really happened. They show these evolutionary trees of life and at the bottom they have typed in invertebrate ancestor or sometimes it says single-celled ancestor well why don't they show what it is they wouldn't have any idea what it is that's why and then someone took a box of crayons and they drew nice colorful lines from the words invertebrate ancestor to everything on earth and that's supposed to prove that everything evolved from the word invertebrate ancestor. Thinking about it, does anyone see any proof of Darwinism here? No. 
for each one of those lines to be scientific, they'd have to be made up of millions of transitional fossils as one kind slowly changed into another. And here we are, over 150 years after Darwin's book came out, and they don't have a single viable missing link of any sort that'll hold up to scientific scrutiny. They only have four or five that they even try to throw out there to fool people with. You know, thousands of creatures are found entombed in amber. And we're told that this amber is up to 250 million years old. Well, things are supposed to evolve over time, right? Well, all the creatures found trapped in amber look just like the living ones today. There's no evidence of Darwinism in the fossil record. This book says, Archaeopteryx is the missing link between reptiles and birds. This was found two years after Darwin's book came out. They say Archaeopteryx was about the size of a pigeon, and it had claws on its wings, proving it's a reptile becoming a bird. Well, the Hudson is found in South America today. He's about the size of a pigeon and has claws on his wings. No one's saying he's a missing link of any sort. Actually, think about this. They found modern bird fossils below the layer that had Archaeopteryx in it. Now, they say that in the evolutionary past, the layers formed slowly. Well, if modern birds were there before, then he couldn't be much of a missing link, could he? If they were found below him way before, that doesn't make any sense. And here's a real dagger through this. Reptile DNA doesn't have the genetic information to produce feathers, which are very complex structures. Even though they keep saying that's what happened, it's not there. And real science, a believer's best friend, knows of no way for nature to add that kind of genetic information to a gene pool. In other words, it doesn't add up. In fact, now they're starting to say Archaeopteryx may not have been a missing link. Maybe he was just a feathered dinosaur. No, he was a bird. He was a perching bird. An odd bird, but a bird. Have you ever seen the whale evolution series? Or the camel evolution series? Uh, they're, they're all pretty much the same. Here's the whale series. It shows this extinct land animal, whose name I can't pronounce, <laughs> and, and then uh, Ambulocetus here, he's the work of art. He's supposed to be the missing link. Here are the bones found. And the white bones were the ones that, uh, let's see, the white bones were found in a different strata layer than the black one, and in a different location. They weren't even in the same layers or locations, but they put them together and they came up with about 25% of a skeleton and say, that's the missing link, Ambulocetus. And they draw a nice picture of what he probably looked like. He had no pelvic girdle. They don't even know if he ran, swam, flew, or what. But that's a missing link. And Basilosaurus is actually 10 times that size but he wouldn't fit in the propaganda if they drew him to size, now would he? So that's the whale evolution. And even though there is no actual evidence for whale evolution, some scientists counterfeit it. They add leg bones 
to whale skeletons, or blow holes and fins from whales to remains of land mammals, and then they send them to museums for their exhibits. It's out and out fraud. And then they lie to the kids, telling them it's scientific fact. Oh, here's the horse evolution one. We are told the fossil record is complete enough to trace the modern day horse all the way back through all these different times and lines from one kind to another. Well, first of all, this was invented in 1874. The fossils have never been found in the order that's presented here. Modern horse fossils are actually found below these other ones in lower layers. Modern horses are. And they're all horses, just different micro adaptations and different sizes. It's no proof of evolution, but they put this in textbooks and say that it is, with a nice colored line going from one to the other with their crayons. This book says that the lobe fin fish are the missing link between fish and amphibians. And the story goes that the lobe fin fish couldn't swim, so he walked around on the bottom of the ocean on those lobe fins. I guess one day he got bored, so he climbed out on land and became an amphibian. It's a nice story, but the amphibian has feet, shoulders, elbows, claws, skeletal system, a muscular system, a central nervous system, a different neck system. Science doesn't have any way for nature to add new and beneficial genetic information, much less the millions of pieces this would have required. It's just not true. And guess what? The lobe-finned fish, which they thought was extinct for 300 million years, was found alive today. There he is. He doesn't walk around on the bottom of the ocean floor. He's a very good swimmer. And the fossilized version that they say is 300 plus million years old looks just like the living one with no evolutionary change. I always say there's two ways to look at the evidence, though. And I say that either that fish refutes the old Earth dating methods and Darwinism, or maybe that scuba diver is 325 million years old. You'll have to make your own choice as to what you're going to believe. This one was appropriately announced on April Fool's Day in 2006, and it's now one of the messiahs of Darwinism. Tiktaalik Rosea. Here's what they said when they announced it. And think about what this says. It's a, they said, it's still a fish, but exhibiting changes that anticipate the beginnings of digits, proto-wrists, elbows, and shoulders. Let me reread that and think about it. It's exhibiting changes that don't even show the beginning, that anticipate some random chance mutation in the future that will lead to the beginning of wrists, shoulders, elbows. How do you have random chance mutations that anticipate? And now this is one of their messiahs, Tiktaalik. Think about this, Tiktaalik and the fossilized lobe fin fish that we find today have bones exactly like the living lobe fin fish. From the fossilized lobe fin fish to the living lobe fin fish, there's no change in them. So why would we think that Tiktaalik's fins should turn into wrists, elbows, 
shoulders, etc. Here's another college textbook which says, look, all these creatures have two bones in the forelimb, from a human arm to the wing of a bat, the foreleg of a horse, or dog, or cat, frog, bird, lizard. And it says that's proof that they all have derived from a common ancestor. And what do they say that common ancestor that we all evolved from is? The lobe fin fish. Can you believe that? <laughs> They're still saying that in textbooks today when it's been proven wrong. There's not a shred of change in the lobe fin fish fossils found. My friends, see the argument for similarity, whether it be similar bone structure or similar biochemistry, is really a better argument for the case that we have the same designer. Ooh, think about that. So in case you think it's just me saying that they've got no evidence, scientists have known this for a long time. In fact, back in 1930, Richard Goldschmidt came up with the hopeful monster theory to explain why they have no evidence. And he said, well, maybe reptiles laid eggs and birds popped out, leaving no evidence behind. Ooh. Well, most people were laughing at the hopeful monster theory, so 50 years later, around 1980, famous evolutionists Niles Eldridge and Stephen Gould of Harvard changed the hopeful monster theory just slightly and they came up with a better sounding name, punctuated equilibrium. And this is now a key concept for Darwinian evolutionism. If a kid asks the professor, well, why is there no evidence in the fossil record? He's going to say, Punctuated equilibrium. Don't you know anything? And how is kid going to answer that? What that means, by the way, is that evolution didn't just happen overnight, but it's happened in a short spurt of time. And then there was a long period of no change called stasis. Then there was a period of fast evolution. And then another long period with no change so, no evidence was captured in the fossil record. Ah, ta-da! That explains it. See, it's not just me saying they've got no evidence. They have a theory explaining why they've got no, what? No evidence. They've got no evidence. <laughs> See, I thought science was knowledge gained from the study and testing of evidence. Right. Darwinism isn't science, and neither is millions of years belief. They are both beliefs. You've got to be thinking, oh, come on now, Brian. What about the ape men? We've all been shown the hominids, the closest link between ape and man, right? Okay, well, let's take a look at some of the famous hominids. Here's a modern textbook showing humans related to jellyfish and worms connected by a nice red line. What, could, what more could you want than a nice red line, huh? And as you know, when we're just talking about this and looking at the crayon drawings, it starts to look kind of silly, doesn't it? But if you're a student in school and you've gone home and read the book, and then you sit in class and you're told this is the evolution proof, you're not going to be thinking it's silly. You're going to most likely accept it, like I did, and you'll be one of those 85% who leave the church by the age of 20. Piltdown Man, 
was the Messiah of Darwinism from about 1912 to the mid-1950s, for about 45 years. This Piltdown Man was probably the number one reason why we eventually kicked creation and prayer out of our schools and started teaching our future citizens that they evolved without God. Piltdown Man. Because it changed so many people's thinking over that crucial 45-year period. And then, finally, in 1955, it was discovered that these jokers had taken the skull cap of a human, the jawbone from an orangutan, filed them down to fit together, acid treated both sides, and buried them in a rock quarry in Piltdown, England. They came along two years later, dug up Piltdown Man, and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned evolutionists, speaking wherever they wanted to speak. And they misled not millions, but billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, based on a total fraud. Nebraska man was used as proof for Darwinism. All they found for Nebraska man back in the 1920s was a piece of a broken tooth. But they got pretty creative. From a piece of a broken tooth, they constructed Nebraska man, his family, even the tools they would have worked with. From the piece of a broken tooth. And it was later proven that that tooth came from an extinct peccary, an extinct pig. And they made it into Nebraska Man. There have been other frauds too, like Ramapithecus, which was counterfeited to look like a human jawbone with eight teeth. It was in the textbook for 45 years even after it was proven to be an orangutan. But we could be here for a week covering all the frauds. They trot out new ones and misinterpret evidences of all kinds all the time. And I'm not going to cover all the frauds because there are too many. You're going to have to be able to stand on your own and say, if this goes against the word of God, I'm putting my faith first in the Word of God. You can't put your faith in these things. It's sad, but it's just the way it is. Put your faith in the Word of God. Then, here's the modern Messiah for Darwinism since 1974. This is Lucy. And these were the bones originally found with Lucy about 30% of a skeleton. And they said, we know it's an ape becoming human because the femur, the thigh bone, angles to the knee. And human thigh bones angle to the knee. They said, that proves it's an ape becoming human. They forgot to mention that almost all tree-dwelling apes have angled femurs. They said, Think about this, that the knee joint is slightly bigger than a normal ape's knee. Well, my friends, if you look at every knee joint in this room, they'll all be different sizes. That proves nothing. There's no proof of evolution there. They also forgot to point out that the knee joint in question was found over a mile away and 230 feet deeper in the strata. Forgot to mention it. If that was Lucy, Lucy's knee, I want to see the airplane that hit that monkey because it must have been going about 700 miles per hour right through the treetops, right? Lucy. Barack Obama just went to Kenya and said, the home of Lucy, where we all came from. Oh, gee. 
Now, other such fossils have been found since Australopi Australopithecus afarensis is the scientific name. And they have curved toes and fingers for grabbing onto tree limbs. And this from 30 years ago. Anatomists have concluded that these creatures are not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright in the human manner. Yet, here's a new textbook showing Lucy walking perfectly upright with human-shaped feet and talking on a cell phone. <laughs> that says a lot. <laughs> it, it's not true. So, Tumay Man is one of the new messiahs. It's in the new books. They say, it's older than any hominid known before. <coughs> you ever notice it's always got to be the oldest or the youngest to get the grant money? Yeah. Well, anyway, when they actually found this in 2002, Nature Magazine said, this is just an eight. When they found it, Science News reported that the teeth are apes. It didn't walk on two legs. They knew it was an ape when they found it. But they wait 10 years and put it in the textbooks as the new missing link, the closest link between ape and man. David Pilbeam, a Yale professor of anthropology, said that Human evolution theories reveal more about how humans view themselves than it does that it does about how humans came about. I'll say that again. He said that human evolution theories reveal more about how humans view themselves than it does about how humans came about. If you want to believe that you came from a wet rock, that is your belief. But stop teaching it in our schools as if it were science. Now think about it logically. With millions of individual apes and monkeys having lived and died over the past 500 years alone, why does finding a monkey bone prove evolution? Doesn't it just prove that when monkeys die, they just leave their bones behind? That's all it proves. Dr. Dwayne Gish defined Darwinism as the sustenance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links unseen. Almost sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's a new textbook showing kids that humans are related to apes and primates by nice colorful lines, like the Tarsier. We're related to the Tarsier. Grandma, what big eyes you've got. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Malcolm Muggeridge stated, the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious a hypothesis could be accepted. But my friends, it's accepted because it's being taught in our secular public schools as if it were science. It's not science. It's a religious belief. Professing themselves to be wise, they've been fooled and change the glory of the uncorruptible God. Into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. See, these verses are talking about idolatry. The highest form of idolatry is to think that you evolved, you're your own God. That was the original sin in the Garden of Eden, right? Eat of the tree, 
Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God. Nothing ever changes. But a review of Darwinism against actual, observable, empirical evidence will show us that the law of biogenesis has never been overcome. Darwinism could not have started. Mathematical probability says it never happened. No one has ever seen anything evolve. The fossil record shows no missing links that hold up to true scientific scrutiny. We don't have any half this, half that flopping around on the earth today, do we? No. And my friends, it's not because of hopeful monsters, and it's not because of punctuated equilibrium, and it's not because the evidence got lost in the iffy stuff. It's because gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. And real science is a believer's true friend. Real science. But billions of years and Darwinism is simply humanistic indoctrination, which is undermining and damaging scientific research, scientific education, and the saving faith of billions of people around the globe. And 85% of our kids are leaving the church by the age of 20 today. We need to get this in <coughs> to them. <coughs> we received this email from a recovered victim of false science. Somebody like me who used to believe this. And he wrote, I hold an advanced degree in biology and came to your seminar to debate you about Darwinism. Instead, I left realizing what I had been taught was based upon a lie. God bless you for what you're doing. It's actually a friend of mine got this email. So why the Bible? Why do I choose to believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claim to be divine other than human in origin. So I choose to believe them. And my friends, by learning real science, we can chop down the thorn bush of false science, known as billions of years and the Darwinian process. Then the soil is ready for the planting of the seed, God's word. Plow up the soil, plant the seed. Let's reap a bountiful harvest and save souls for the glory of our Lord and Creator, Jesus Christ. <laughs>